so it's not only about you, but it's for you, because you know, I really wanted to um, reflect it back. You know, I wanted it to be a, a believing mirror for you. Um, and uh, to just uh, let the book breathe life into your generosity of spirit and uh, the long history that we have shared. Um, and may it inspire generations to come. That is my hope. Okay, so I want to talk about the book a little bit, because that's why we're, one of the reasons we're here tonight. Um, this is my living room in Oregon, and it's sort of the, the late think tank stage of the book. And, and what I did uh, after Tony came and visited a couple times and, and pulled shots that he thought might be good for a book, I just kind of, you know, we printed them out together, and then I had copies, and I just started laying them, laying them down on the floor of the living room and just sort of letting things rise to the surface and, and tell me what the book wanted it wanted to be. And, and, and this is kind of how my living room was for several weeks, just kind of like this very organic process. And, uh, you know, this was just one step on the way. And then, you know, then a lot of it happens electronically, and it's a, it was a first for me. It's, it's pretty fascinating. And then, it hap and then the train is moving. And yeah, many, many late nights. But it was, it was, it was my dream come true, really, to do this book. So, and uh, like I said, I, I couldn't have bet ended up with a better publisher and um, a, a more gorgeous book. So I'm, I'm very, very happy about that. This is the cabin, which is my studio in Oregon, which is where I live. I thought maybe you'd like to see it. See I'll be visiting. <laughs> well, that's a, there's a guest room. And uh, you know, we, Mike and I fancy, well, I fancy ourselves as the Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. <laughs> so, you know, we like, we like bohemians and we like Marxists and, you know, come, come on down, <laughs> come on up. <laughs> Some of you have already stayed there. <laughs> this is Tony and me in, the, in one of the studio rooms. And uh, we're going through the, the 40 years worth of material. It's like 40 years, I don't know, six different formats, and then digital starting in 2008. It's a mess. And Tony's amazing because he doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't phase him. You know, he's, he's a real master at. Uh, creating really elegant books. And um, uh, that part of it was not, not difficult at all for him. Um, this is my buddy, Marcus Ewart. And I, I'm starting with the image of Marcus because Marcus and I, we workshopped this book while I was living in San Francisco. And we, we were both um, early adapters of Julia Cameron's work called The Artist's Way. And we took that work to heart. And we decided to have every couple of weeks, we would do like an artist date together. And we, we would um, ask each other to have, in my case, 10 pages of photographs. In his case, a couple pages of his manuscript, which is a biographical piece. And we, would, we wouldn't meet and work uh, critically, we would just meet and be each other's sort of believing mirrors and, and cheer, cheerleaders. And we, we would have a really nice brunch. We did that for, for quite a few months and on and off. Um, and so he really was on the ground floor of, of the vision part of this book. And I'm, I'm just so grateful for that friendship and, uh, and also our collaboration as artists. You know, this, this is a recreation of Diane Arbus' photo. And it's also significant to start with it because um, Arbus, as as intense as she is, she was really uh, she was a transformative experience for me. Um, I, I have a, a high school mentor that she created a, a club of a kind of after hours club uh, at after school hours, where all the freaks in the school could go and hang out, and um, it was called the Freedom Express, and. Um, uh, and that teacher, her name is Joan Salerno, she's still a very close friend, and um, she took a group of kids down to New York City to see the Broadway play 
1776 about the writing of our Constitution and a musical. And, um, and then, coincidentally, she took us to the Museum of Modern Art, where I gazed upon the, the first posthumous exhibit of Diane Arbus's work. And out from the wall, gazing back, were transvestites and, and butch women. And, and basically, for a 17-year-old to have this this sort of um, barometer of the fact that other people like me existed was hugely influential. And, and of course, I want, and then I wanted to be the Diane Arbus of the gay community when, when by the time I hit San Francisco. So I, I really wanted this picture to, to be, be a success. And we worked very hard at uh, making this one happen. Uh, Scott Pimentel styled it. Dina Davenport did the wig for Jillian Clark, who's the mother figure in the background. Um, Meredith's sister, and, and Meredith and Jillian are also great allies. They, they styled so many things out of my studio and you know, just helped me in whatever way was needed. And, and so many of you have done that with me. It's, a, it's, a, it's just so great to be back in San Francisco because of that. So we're gonna flash back a little bit. Uh, God, I lost my notes on the years. I think this is actually like 57. And um, I put this in because I thought that maybe if any of you had any doubts about homosexuality being caused by <laughs> nature versus nurture, uh, this would put, it, put your uh, <laughs> confusion to rest. <laughs> Um, this is an Easter Sunday pick, and that's my sister Mickey, and then my cousin Ronnie, and um, and you know I think it's in terms of nurture though you gotta love the auntie or the 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 elder that just wedged that person my elbow and and just was totally okay with that. <laughs> uh, we think maybe it's actually a camera camera, which even has more of a meta. Thing, you know? My mom was a great snapshot enthusiast, and so that really is my first influence in terms of photography because our household was full of snapshot moments, and the collection is just, just breathtaking. I, I'm only going to share a couple more, but um, they're pretty cool. This one's, this is uh, about three or four years later, maybe. I, I wish I had the dates, but um, uh, what's interesting? thing about this is, oh god, I had, I, I wrote down, oh yeah, so one of the signs, so my parents, my mom was a showgirl, and my dad was a union guy, and um, he was a union leader, and so I, I feel like this photo is sort of the first inkling of the hybridization in my, my formation of my identity of, uh, you know, fusing theater with, with um, politics. And so um, there I am in drag, in a little tutu. You can barely see it. Um, but, you know, we're lobbying my parents to let me go to the public school. My mom was, was desperate for me to have a Catholic education, and I wanted to go have uh, an education with my friends. One of the signs says, I demand equal rights. Free me from St. Peter's without flunking. <laughs> <laughs> That's my brother and sister, too, in the picture. And, and a couple, actually, all my siblings are there. And uh, uh, the best sign is it says, he wants mod. You know, the hullabaloo, which Mark Hughes' dad was an editor, was, was really seminal for me. I mean, I saw those go-go girls on that show, and I thought I wanted to be a go-go girl. Um, this is, uh, my parents uh, wisely bought me a Super 8 camera after, you know, me, me begging them. And I, uh, uh, this is me getting one for Christmas, and, um, about three or four years later, I think, or maybe around 13, 14, I don't know. I, I started making films in high school, and I made a film called Funky Flags, which was kind of influenced by the anti-war semantics of the time. Um, Country Joe and the Fish was what I was listening to. And um, I did this whole thing with cutout flags. And, um, and I won a Kodak Teenage Movie Award. And it was just two free rolls of film and a little certificate. But,
You could not stop me after that. <laughs> um, this, this is before I was born in 52. It's the, it's the review that my mom was a showgirl for. And um, it, they were called the Jack Norman's Broadway to Hollywood Review. And uh, it's, it's, this is a page from that great book called Showgirls. And it and talks about the Normans. And they were this really beloved outfit that was very, you know, they treated their personnel really great. And, and, um, and they traveled with the straights shows. So my mom actually worked kind of in relationship to the carnival. And I always feel very much like carnival people and, and that world is part of my world. And, uh, and then when she met my dad and, and got married, she sort of stopped. And, um, and I feel she handed the torch to me, you know. And that's my mom. Uh, you know, my mom's on the right, uh, on your right, and she's the first step up, but a very beautiful woman. And she, of course, she continued to do theater through us. She would, you know, push us kids into talent shows all the time. And I was, was a tyrannical director and would put on shows in my, um, my basement of our house. This is my mom in Atlantic City, and that's her sister Mary in the middle. And I just threw this one in because you've got to love the zebra formals. <laughs> that's my mom on your right, I believe. No, my mom's on your left. Her show name was Jeanette. Her real name was Helen. It's interesting because um, uh, it, her father died when she was 17 of pneumonia. And the way she told it was, if he had been living, there was no way she would have been allowed to be in this show. And, but because it was you know, my, a single mom running this household of like six kids, she was allowed to go on the road. And it really sort of, um, well, she met my dad on the road. so. So here's the torch handed over. This is me in Castro, or, well, in San Francisco. Um, it's on, it's at the, actually at the Haight Street Fair. Um, and so I'm, uh, you know, I'm be, uh, try, trying to feel my way through drag. And, and uh, this is my boyfriend at the time, Michael Long. Many of you probably knew him. Um, and he was part of the group called the Whiz Kids, which was the Seattle version of the Cockettes, and they did stuff together, and uh, Michael was great. And uh, I think Mark Custis, you may have actually taken this photo. I'm not sure on that, but um, I know we were kind of hanging out with you guys right at this moment. I loved clowns, and I kind of was doing I actually was modeling myself after the Cockette pristine condition. And um, Prissy was, you know, was a coquette, and the coquettes had already disbanded, but Prissy was around doing shows. And I would follow Prissy around like a little puppy dog, trying to get the definitive shot of Prissy. And she was very tolerant and patient of me. And um, uh, this is one of Prissy's first shows that I photographed called The Passion of Barbara Martinez, which Dolores Deluxe was also in. Dolores is here tonight. But you know, fortunately, I kind of gave up drag because I wasn't a very good drag queen. And uh, I think I decided that by doing photography, you could kind of be in that world without having to stick your neck out. Uh, it, also, around the same time, I had a romance with Stephen Brown, um, and who lived in a commune on Castro Street of note. And um, uh, Stephen asked me if I would come photograph a show that he was in. And um, I was definitely interested in theater, but kind of clueless still. And uh, I just went because my boyfriend asked me if I would photograph his show. Um, and uh, and the, the show was the, the, my first Angels of Light show. It was called In For No Reason. Tahara was in it. Yeah, we, ha we have to have the lights so that the ASL person can actually see be seen. So th yeah, I don't know if you can maybe wiggle. Uh, no, this is what we got. Yeah. yeah. And it's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, this is my first Angels of Light show. And I was blown away. And I, I immediately wanted to work with 
with the angels. Um, and then uh, also at the same time was an amazing place called the Hula Palace, which is one of the first places I exhibited as an artist. And it was uh, a group of people that had a household on Castro at 19th, Lee Mentley, who was one of the main uh, proprietors and residents is here tonight. Thank you. First person to ever show me in San Francisco. Um, and it was so much fun. They would astrologically forecast when was an appropriate time to do a salon in the, in the, you know, in the tradition of Gertrude Stein, they would have a three-day party and basically art on the walls and performances. And uh, here we have Michael Shane uh, again and uh, Cand Candice Valdala, also known as Candida Royale. And they were in a little fashion show, theater or theatrical, with the, the costuming was by Lord and Kimbrell. Um, you know, and by this time, we're getting to know each other. And, uh, you know, peop the people from the theater community love to be photographed. And so I... Uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, and, and I very much wanted to be part of that world. Uh, I'm, this is Dolores Deluxe and Amber Waves in their show called Broken Dishes, which played at the Mabuhay Gardens. And uh, Dolores is here tonight from L.A. Your daughter? Amber. Amber, oh. Uh, uh. Tell her I gave her some props tonight. Uh, this show was amazing, and I, I did projections for them. I did slides and movies, and, and Ken Denning, who's here, was my, my cohort on that. And um, it, was, it was at the Mabuhay, right when the punk thing was jumping off, but we had the earlier, uh, you want to switch? OK. Um, we had the, the punk thing, what we would be leaving the theater, and they would be coming in and they were kind of crude and we I'd be carrying two big projectors and it was insane what we were trying to do but it was fun um, uh, I I want to uh, Uh, this is Hibiscus, which was also uh, um, a New York City. These were the New York Angels of Light with the horse of a different color. Um, but Hibiscus, is, is, as we now know through uh, historical revelation, was one of the, the seminal people for both the Cockettes and the Angels. Uh, but when he came back from New York, all of the, the local angels were a little bit agog that he was doing this very Vegas review. and. <laughs> You know, was was promoting himself as the person who who started the Angels, and um, so. But we all, you know, we kept on going back to the show, which was pretty fabulous. And they were, and he was very sweet to me and let me come photograph. And um, and and we have, um, well, Louise Harris. Let's see, I gotta get the direction. Louise, on your left is Louise Harris, his sister, who continued to perform with Hibiscus all throughout his life. Um, Ginger. Uh, who we lost to AIDS, my friend Chi Chi Wilson, um, who we, I don't know where she is, Angel Jack, who is Hibiscus's lover, and then Java Jet, and who is our beloved Bambi Lake. Um, so um, here's just another one of, of Hibiscus from the same show with uh, Ebony St. Gerard, who was also Sandy in the Cuckettes. Um, and, and uh, I'm trying to get up to the picture. Oh, and here's our beloved Bill Bowers, who's with us tonight. <laughs> Billy was also one of those people that I followed around like a little puppy dog, trying to get the definitive shots of. And, um, and when I gave Billy this print for his birthday one year, he's like, oh, what a nice image. And he did not even realize that it was himself. <laughs> And, um, but then it all came, came rushing back. <laughs> uh, this is the Hooker's Ball, by the way, which was at the, at the, uh, the Hilton. I think they never hosted it a second time. <laughs> uh, and here's December Wright, who, was, uh, who I think is also here. Dee, are you here? 
Yeah, honey. <laughs> December and I were both born on December 23rd. And we've stayed close ever since. And um, I didn't know December when I took this picture. Uh, Dee was uh, a, a regular backup singer and, and stage person for Sylvester. And we got to be close friends throughout the years. And, um, and this p picture, I just love it. You know. <laughs> Castro Street Fair, second, second annual. And here's Sylvester in Golden Gate Park. With his boyfriend, we think his name is Willie, and you know, there's not real clear documentation on, on this person or his name, so if anybody can help us out on that, we're, we're all ears. Uh, and, uh, and here, of course, is Reggie, who was both with the Cockettes and, and with the Angels, and, and, uh, and this is the parade in 75, and I, I know who Reggie is, but I don't really know him yet, and we became very close over the years. Um, and the reason I knew who Reggie was was because of the amazing book called Idols. I don't know if you know it, but you used to be able to find them in the thrift stores, and, and it was this really high color printing of a lot of New York avant-garde people and the, and the coquettes when they went to New York, were, were photographed by this, this artist named Gilles Lorraine. And it was kind of this, this book that was really important for me. And, um, and, I, and I sort of sought those people out. Like I would, would try to get you know, shots of Reggie and, and developed a friendship. In the, in the beginning of that book, there's a quote that I want to read, because it kind of was, it was the, the uh, essence of the day for a lot of us. Um, the book was published in 1973, and then it was reissued in 2011 with a foreword by uh, Ryan McGinley, who's an openly queer photographer who I admire. And there's also, an, uh, um, uh, that was Powerhouse Books that did it, and there, uh, there's a few newer photos by Lorraine in it. Um, the book of theatrical portraits was inhabited by the Coquettes, from their ill-fated New York City tour, early portraits of Harvey Firestein, and many of the people in the centrifuge that was the Warhol factory and other luminaries of the off-off Broadway scene from the day like Larry Ray. And uh, he was the earliest iteration of the ballet Trocadero. Um, and the quote in the front of the book, uh, which struck a chord really, I think, for a whole generation, uh, is, is as follows. We dress for our own pleasure and get off on each other. It's our own small world. Within it, we understand and we are understood, and we do what we want. When we put on our clothes, we feel free. If other people want to share in our joy and freedom, they're welcome to. There's strength and self-confidence in the way I dress. Suddenly, I don't feel ugly anymore. No, it, it, really, it doesn't say who wrote it. I, I would assume Gilles Lorraine wrote it. Uh, I, I mean, that would make sense to me since it's not attributed, but um, I think it's kind of the, part of the mystery of the book. So jumping forward a little bit, um, this group of, of queens came to town. <laughs> I think it's around 75-ish, 76. I first met Doris Fish in the line waiting to go in to see Bette Midler at Bimbo's. And uh, I, I was like, who is that? <laughs> and, and, you know, I think at first, you know, she raised eyebrows with the angels and, and eventually they ended up doing shows together and, uh, and a lot, lot more. Um, but they were called the Sluts of Gogo, and they performed with the tubes, as Michael Zagaris would know, you know? And uh, Michael Zagaris did a book with Tony Norman last year called uh, Total Excess, and it's just stunning. You know, I, I, I just love your book, Michael. Totally great. A lot of the music scene that I, the, the music that I know and love. And Mike was also a camera store customer at, at Castro Camera, so I used to wait on him back in the day. Anyway, here's Doris and Tippy and Frida Lay and Miss X. Miss X is the only survivor now, and she's carrying on the torch pretty well. 
doing amazing theater and, and raising a family, three beautiful girls. And then also, uh, Mark Eustace uh, was with the Angels of Light initially. Uh, we did theater together. We did the next Angels show called Parasites Under the Bourgeoisie together. And then we did, um, and then the filmmaking stuff started. And um, uh, Mark started doing film with the Angels. And we would show them to small groups of friends in our apartments. and. You know, it was, so, it was so great to show your slides and stuff to the angels because they were just so appreciative and, and very vocal about it. And so it was always kind of exciting. And then Mark and I got the idea to show the work to, um, you know, the community, like have a, a public showing. And that, in a sense, is considered the, the, the first moment of what's now the LGBT uh, film festival. So it's kind of a cool thing that it started out with. Just uh, you know, s f like this this passage for us by us, you know, kind of thing. And it kind of still is that in a way. Um, but this is Mark's film Unity, which was very you know, seat of the pants production. Um, shot shot in sixteen, was it Mark? Super eight. Super eight, and then and then boosted to sixteen. And this is. I had syphilis that day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't. You know. You weren't worse for the wear, and you you did not. You didn't get it from me, girl. <laughs> but I did think you were hot back then, boy. I'll never forget the first moment I saw Mark rehearsing for Parasites, and it was the the big hall at the Angels um, place on Oak Street, and they had just wall to wall mirror, and all the people were in there dancing and doing, you know, body moves. And it was really this sort of like crystalline moment. And, uh, you know, we've, we've worked together solidly really since, since then. So it's, it's a, an amazing friendship. And, and same with Lulu, who's, who's pictured here. Lulu, as we all know, is, is really sort of, you know, such a great mover and a shaker in our community. And, and we're just so thrilled to have him you know, as a performer and as a friend. And uh, Lulu is actually in the book like eight times, so that tells you something right there. And you're the one that's gonna have to reckon with the, the people that aren't in the book. <laughs> that should be. <laughs> I don't know what I just did. Did that turn on screen? I just touched the, the, the cursor key. Yay, thank you. <laughs> There's an amazing picture of me from um, uh, this day flanked by Lulu and Silvana in full drag, and I'm kind of working the 30s look. But I didn't put it in because I didn't want you to end up thinking that I was a black hole of narcissism. <laughs> But here is a picture of me, and this is uh, this is my photo group, and this is um, the photographers that I was hanging, the still photographers that I was hanging out with, and we would meet every couple of weeks just to share resources and knowledge. Um, I don't, I think maybe we were called the Gay Freedom Photo Archives, um, but there's Rink, uh, our our dear colleague, um, with the two bananas, and our friend Sandy Graham. Cookie, myself, and Efren Ramirez and I are still very close. Um, this is in my apartment on Ashbury, and it's a, um, what do you call it? Um, the tripod, you put the camera on the tripod, self-portrait. Self this, this is a flyer of our show, and we would go around to different community centers, and we would show the history of the gay parade in San Francisco, and that was kind of what we did. But it, you know, it's, look at it, it's type, typewriter, you know, with press on letters and all of that. Uh, this is the great Alan Barraby, who was kind of, you know, radical fairy identified before the words had ever been uttered. And, uh, um, and then Alan also became a great 
LGBT historian because he got he found uh, these letters of um, guys coming out of World War II, well, men and women, and uh, who were discharged dishonorably discharged, and they they kept journals and they wrote about their lives, and he found these letters uh, amongst each other, and he was very moved uh, by them, and and then that was what started the work which later became the book um, Coming Out Under Fire and then a documentary film. And, and Alan got um, uh, a MacArthur to do that work. And so it was really a very important moment for queer scholarship because it was sort of one of the first times that a major grant put forth you know, uh, support for um, queer, queer scholarship. And, and Alan's no longer with us, but I, you know, I thought this negative wasn't going to pan out, and then Tony kind of saved it, and and such a really great shot of Alan. I'm just so thrilled we were able to, to have it in the book. His lover came to my um, New York thing, and, and it was just such a great, a sweet uh, meeting of the minds. Um, and of course, I have to talk about Harvey. Um, I worked at Castro Camera for three years. Uh, this is one of my favorite shots of Harvey. My God, I have eight minutes to finish like 60 more slides. <laughs> um, uh, the thing about Harvey I just want to say is that, the, you know, everybody talks about coalition building, and, and Harvey was this great coalition builder. But I think from my perspective, which was kind of a unique perspective, I was able to see that one of the things that motivated this man was his love of male companionship and that his he had this very deep sense of indignation that that could not exist in the world in a safe in a safe context and so he devoted his life to to transforming that and i think you know if you read his love letters and you uh, see that that's sort of his first impulse that it, it becomes clear why he did a lot of the things that he did and 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 I love this picture with his dear friend Denton and my dear friend Denton Smith because it's just sort of that that they're they're sharing the daily comics, which was sort of a ritual at Castro Camera. Um, here's Harvey with uh, Jose Saria, and uh, oh God, I um, I could go on and on about Jose. Um, and also the the Imperial Court, um, so so important. You know, Harvey's the one that. Uh, basically brought me down to the Sir Center and said, you have to vote for Emperor and Empress. It's really important, you know. And what he was doing was building a con constituency for um, getting elected. And, and, you know, they weren't necessarily buying in initially, although he did have the column in BAR and he, he did have Jose's support really out the gate. But I think that there was sort of this tentativeness. And then when he got elected, um, it was just so palpable. They were so appreciative of him. And like this, this is one of their annual drag balls. And here's Harvey and Jose and Mavis. And they're, they're presenting a check for um, the, the, um, the, a donation for the uniforms for the first ever gay and lesbian marching day band which if you can imagine that. And, and what I remember about this moment is that the audience, the, the applause in the audience was so thunderous that you, it felt like the building was shaking because they were just so appreciative that one of theirs had gotten elected. Mavis, also an amazing character who was sort of peripheral to the Cuckettes and was a bartender at the end, uh, end touch. Amazing costume designer. Uh, this is inside the ballroom. This is Lakeish Hayworth. Uh, this is, I, I love this one. This is sort of the Diane Arvis coming out in me. Um, this is uh, also the Imperial Court System, Michelle, who, uh, who like Ruth opening tonight, uh, Michelle opened for me in New York and, and uh, wowed the crowd with some real sort of scandalous gossip. Um, Somebody asked Michelle, why were you not ever an empress? And she told us that night, I think it was the first time she revealed that she actually ran for empress. Uh, the second year was, was a shoe in as, as far as she was concerned, but then a new queen 
just kind of whisked into town and, and really captured people's imaginations because she was, as Michelle said in her own words, she was really fabulous and, and won. And so Michelle was like, okay, well, I guess that's it. I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll be in the world, but I won't ever be an empress. And they, and they were cleaning, this is what Michelle told us this night, they were cleaning up um, after the, the ball, and they found in the dressing room a bunch of crumpled up ballots. <laughs> And you know, it's, it's so interesting to me that uh, she, she just concealed that all those years, you know. <laughs> and uh, Michelle ra ran the hair salon a couple doors down from Harvey shop and Michelle was um, uh, one of the earliest people, of the earliest queer people to move into the, the, the neighborhood. Uh, this is Lawanda Rose and Shadwan on Haight Street. Um, Lawanda uh, is sort of also pre-radical fairy, radical fairy, um, very dear friend that we're still in touch. And um, uh, th there was a group of people that w were kind of thinking in terms of rural living, had gone to the land in Wolf Creek and, and went to, attended a very important uh, uh, historical event called the the Faggots and Class Struggle Conference. And, um, and so that was sort of a, a really beginning for a lot of things that came later under the nomenclature of the radical fairies and, um, and a lot of the people um, that were kind of in that world were, were at that conference. I, I stupidly was not, but um, I, I'm playing catch up. This is, this is a lot of those folks. Uh, this is at Dougie Caldwell's house. It's a puss print pajama party. Uh, Lulu, Lulu's here in the book again. And, uh, and uh, a lot of these guys are gone. Teddy Matthews, the great Teddy Matthews. Uh, Silvana Nova. Uh, I'm not going to name them all because I'm kind of just a little slippery on time. But um, I think what's interesting is that um, this was 78. Uh, I did want to add that the um, the party favors for the night were quaaludes. <laughs> I, I, I left, but I imagine it got very kai kai in there. <laughs> and, and here's the radical fairies more recently. Um, Um, and I think when Jack Davis and Cayenne threw this party, I don't think they were aware of the thing that happened in 78, um, where the theme was puss print, although that is probably... Um, yes, were. You were? <laughs> Who's them? Is that Jack? Hi. <laughs> but I, you remember I gave you the print for your birthday that night to, yeah, connect the dots. That's what we're here for. And thank you for this picture. I love this picture. And of course, you can't talk about the history of drag without talking about the sisters. I, o I only have this one picture of Jack Furtick, uh, Sister Boom Boom, uh, tonight. But um, you know, Jack was an amazing friend. And, and um, uh, I miss him. Just that, just that simple. Um, and then this is kind of moving, getting up into the late 80s. You know, I actually was a little bit intimidated by the punk scene, but I, I really was thrilled that uh, in the late 80s, queers started to sort of identify and there were, became this sort of act proactive queer punk movement. And so I happened to be lucky to be on the, the, the um, ground floor of that. And, hanging out in some of those clubs and stuff. And, um, you know, I kind of was identifying with the punk scene even before, but I, it was devoid of queer identity, except for in this very stealth way. So this was kind of a, an explosion of visibility, and it was great. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, Mark Eustace's film, uh, which sort of captures some of the, the queer identity of the punk and new wave movement. Uh, it's called Whatever Happened to Susan Jane with the... Yeah. 
amazing Francesca Rosa, who we lost this year, and uh, Lulu. And uh, thank you, guys. And Anne Block, our, our friend who lives in LA still. If you want to see what San Francisco is, was like in the 80s, that's the movie. And we, we can't talk about the history of drag with Arturo Gal without Arturo Galster. Arturo was also part of Sluts A Go Go and just very uh, brilliant and enduring uh, performer and spirit and friend, close, close friend. And <laughs> Portia Peoples, a real crowd pleaser, this photo. But also to talk about the stud, you can't talk about Bohemia and queer San Francisco without talking about the stud, so. Uh, It's in there in a couple places in the book. Uh, and then we're getting into the ACT UP era and censorship issues and AIDS. And uh, um, this is Nick Perea. And uh, it's a demonstration against censorship. And it's a time capsule that Michael Brown made. And it was buried under the ground. And uh, it, it, uh, it's actually, a, this is a slide that's an alternative of the one in the book that has my dear colleague Gerard Koskovich in, if slightly behind Nick in the book. Um, I'm not sure how they got switched out, but uh, they're both pretty sweet. And during that time, um, we all hung out at Club Uranus and Chaos, and one of the queens I met was the beloved Miss Kitty. And Miss Kitty invited me to document his, his challenges and struggles in, in a, as a person with AIDS. And, um, and we became very close allies. And um, you know, Kitty uh, was the original proponent of the fact that green was the healing color of the universe. And so, in honor of my beloved Kitty, And of course, Juanita Moore. Um, Juanita's, Juanita is famous for uh, enrolling uh, yeah, up, upstart photographers in, into documenting her. <laughs> And you know, it was it was I was very flattered because I wasn't young anymore. But she definitely was interested in in uh, working together, as as was I. And so I I mistakenly made a, lost a bet, and and I I said, well, you know, if you know if this thing happens, you you can have ten photo sessions. And 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 I lost the bet, and um, uh, and she's counting them down. So I think I have. <laughs> I think I actually have about four or five more that I still owe her. But Juanita is producing my party because we have such a great uh, friendship. And uh, when a, we, a group of us were putting this, the statue of Harvey in City Hall, Juanita was one of our fiercest fundraisers. And we grew very close through that uh, effort, which took several years. And uh, you know you can't talk about the, the history of drag without talking about Peaches Christ. I love Peaches. I like to say about Peaches that Peaches is uh, the the, the um, how did I put it the other day? She's she's famous for putting the pathological back in homosexuality. <laughs> with 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 panache. And this is Elvira. This is, um, uh, oh God, please help me. What's her? Cassandra. Cassandra, Cassandra Peterson, yeah. Who was in, their, this is on set of Peach's film, um, All About Evil, which was so much fun to work on. And then this is our beloved Avira Sphere. My Uh, this this was kind of what this was the mock-up of what I presented to Tony and you know it was definitely too busy for the book but he's he saw the gravity of who they are and what they're doing and, and we devoted six pages to to Vera Sphere in the book and I 
It's one of the things I'm most proud about because it all happened in the 11th hour when maybe it couldn't happen and it just, it rose, like I said, many of the things just kind of rose to the surface and, and told us what this book needed to be and I, I was so happy they, they were in. I mean, I kind of, you know, I photograph things over and over and then there's certain things you just, it's such a joy to keep on returning to them and, and Vera Sphere uh, certainly are in that category as is Rumi, our beloved Rumi. <laughs> And, and Rumi couldn't be here tonight, and we've we've talked pretty regular. Uh, it's just too strenuous for him right now. He's he's in of ill health, and he's recovering. He's determined to go to uh, New York in October, and I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. And then he'll his film Ruminations will debut within the year, and so we'll all get to have a great party, uh, hopefully at his side. This is the Thrill Peddlers, of course, and I needs probably no introduction here, but they've. Uh, taken on the task of, of remounting the Coquette shows with the vengeance, and uh, uh, they have a huge cult following with, with me at the lead. Uh, and then no book is complete without a little titillation. <laughs> this is Rex Cameron and Bradley Russo. And Glenn Lowy Chi and Daniel Kays. Uh, Glenn and I have been doing a lot of work together. Glenn's the heavily tattooed guy on your right, on your left. And this is my sweetie back in the day when we first met, Mark, Mike Pinatelli with our nephew Tony, who's now in his 30s. <laughs> Uh, John Antonides and Nick Romero and their children from uh, who had this store at Castro Camera for a while. They had a gift store and uh, this is uh, as they were leaving we decided to do this shot in front of the mural. I, I wanted to have something in the book about forming, forging, you know, alternative families and, and uh, they were so happy to be part of the book. I was so, pl so pleased that they said yes. Uh, Chris Menda and Ruth Bernhard, the, the fantastic photographers. Um, and Ruth, uh, if you don't know, was one of the founding members of the Mattachine Society. She's actually on the roster of the early minutes of the Mattachine Society. And she was also one of the first people to do uh, female nudes in a sort of male-dominated culture, the, the California School of Photography, when it really was kind of a very tentative situation, but her work was, was stunning and it was embraced and, and carried forward this, this idea that that, that was, a, it was an okay thing. Um, Ruth was close to about 100 at that point and uh, Chris asked me if I would do that portrait and I was like, of course. And this is uh, one of the gay parades. Uh, This is Dykes on bike, singular. <laughs> and Ruth Villasenor is here tonight. <laughs> Ruth and Randy Burns are both here tonight and, and they both consented to be in the book. And Randy and I go way back, but Ruth and I just met around uh, the, the production of the book and I'm just so thrilled to have them in the book as representatives of First Nation people and Two-Spirit people, and it's just such an essential piece of the book, and um, thank you for your collaboration on that. You know. Here's Randy Burns with Bambi Little Feather, and... Uh, Randy calls me up periodically, and I feel it's such a blessing to hear from him. You know, I, I just I'm, I'm glad he picked me out in a crowd uh, uh, to check in periodically and let me know what's up. And same with Ruth. You know, I, I get these phone calls from Ruth Weiss every every once in a while. Like she she channels me and she says, "How are you doing? What's going on? I I've been I feel you. I think of you." And this was at her garden party in, in Albion, where she lived, lives still. 
Uh, this is a more recent work, and I just kind of wanted to give you a little peek at what I'm, you know, I live in Oregon, and the rural queers up there have found me. They found me out. <laughs> This was a little project we did called a, a forestry camp, and um, I was invited to come and do a calendar as a, a fundraiser for forestry camp. And, and this is Sounder and Braveheart. And uh, this is the church in Golden where Carl Whitman had his commune and, and wrote some of the important manifestos of, of uh, rural queer identity. And, and Carol Queen and Robert Lawrence. representing our bisexual brethren. <laughs> and the late Jazzy Collins. <laughs> this one was a tough one to include because it's so, so um, graphic. Um, but I just felt it was important to talk about what's happening on the international stage. Um, and. Uh, you know, I love this moment because Jazzy had that sort of sense of acknowledgement of, yeah, take my picture, this is, you know. And Richard the Simbo, same thing, you know, he came from uh, Uganda, he was doing some fundraising for his work with uh, Smug, which is uh, a group in Uganda, they're really, you know, sitting ducks in many respects there. And uh, they're doing uh, amazing work, both through the legal system and, and on the ground in Uganda. Uh, and, you know, the marriage equality is in the book. Uh, I don't have a lot of demonstration stuff in the book. Um, I, I think, in a, in a sense, we're letting the portraits tell the, the story of the movement. Um, but, you know, sometimes you, you want to kind of talk about the fact that we do hit the streets and we will continue to hit the streets. And we should... Uh, this is the Trans March. Uh, this is right around the time Brandy Martell was murdered. And uh, it, it w I don't know a lot of the folks, but uh, they asked me to take a picture with their cell phone. And then I, I, I asked them if I could take one with mine. And uh, I think they may have been friends of Brandy's. I love this picture. And this, this is uh, Lieutenant Stephen Thorne, uh, one of our police force uh, who's involved in transgender sensitivity in the San Francisco police force. And uh, I thought it was really important to, uh, this is during um, when we put the plaque in the sidewalk for um, Compton's cafeteria. Uh, Stefan uh, posed for this portrait for me. And this is Scout, who's kind of a mystery. I mean, he, uh, this is a very recent photo and, uh, on one of my junkets to San Francisco. and. We were talking, and I took some portraits right there at 18th and Castro, and it was this beautiful golden light. And, and I was about to get his info, and then Jim Van Busker came up and started chatting me up, and then Scout just kind of like disappeared. I had invited him to a um, thing at the photo center uh, and hoped he would show up, but I, I lost him. But So he's kind of this mystery queer youth at the end of the book. Um, I sort of feel, in a way, he evokes the same energy that uh, Steve McCurry's portrait of the um, Afghanistan girl evokes, like it's that same sort of golden light, and I really like this picture. Um, got to talk about Scott Smith just a little bit. You know, Scott Smith was Harvey's partner and soulmate, and he became the executor of Harvey's estate. And so much of what I do in the world today in terms of scholarship around Harvey's papers is really sort of in direct relationship to the torch that was handed to me by Scott. And um, I just, you know, there isn't a day go by that I don't think about him and what think about how he would do what I'm doing. And um, yeah, I miss him also, and his mom was also a great ally. And this is us. This is the Harvey Milk archives at Scott Smith's apartment, sort of organizing papers. Which you know, a lot of these guys are gone, and we we put information on the the papers when we remembered names and things. So it's a good thing we did this, and those papers are here at the the San Francisco Library now. Utilized a lot. 
And then, of course, you know, you've got to talk a little bit about milk. <clears throat> um, you know, this is Lucas Gorbeil, who played me in the movie. And that's the actual vest that I used to wear. Um, and um, the, Danny Glicker, the customer who came, became a good friend, he wanted to fabricate the vest because uh, he didn't want to use the real one. And I said, that's silly. You know, you got to use the real one. So he dry cleaned it, and, and it's in the movie. Um, well, I mean, it was pretty yellowed, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you couldn't take that thing off of me. I mean, I love that vest. Uh, David Lejeune, the, the guy who sold it to me, he is in touch, and he, uh, he said he sold, it to, he sold it. He was trying to raise money to go see his guru, and he was doing a street sale, and... I came bounding down the street, and he had made a commitment to himself even before he saw me that he would only sell it to the person if they were right for the vest. And so, but, and then I came by, and he sold it to me for like 30 bucks, and then I, I, you couldn't take it off of me. Uh, and here I am with, with Jose. And I, um, yeah, Jose and I got to hang out a bit um, right before he passed on, and strange to Jim, I think, took this picture. Um, and I just love it. Um, this is my portrait of Jose when he stayed at my house during that, that time frame. And uh, um, he, was, he was fantastic. Uh, I'm going to keep it short. This is Viva Dolores' daughter with Prissy. It's the last portrait I took of Prissy before he died of AIDS. But we all got to get together for a 25-year reunion of the Coquettes in the Hula Palace, and oh my God, the musical stuff, and uh, again, three days of art, astrologically forecast as to when MRS. <laughs> incredible, and we said, we said goodbye to Martin Warman. Uh, that was his wake, and uh, it was just an amazing remembrance. And then uh, I think we're getting, we're going to wind it down here with um, yeah. the, Mr. Carney's amazing tribute to the Pink Triangle, taken from a helicopter. I will never do that again. <laughs> Patrick, Patrick, uh, I, uh, Patrick was thrilled, though, that I did it. I don't think anybody's done it yet or since. And then, we, and then the end pages deserves an uh, explanation. I mean, Tony and I were, were, um, were faced with a daunting task to acknowledge all of you and your tremendous work. And, and we, um, we also were charged with the narrative of the movement, but to do in it in a way that things that were chosen for the pages had, had you know, gravity and had a charge and talked about universals and talked about archetypal. And so sometimes simply a portrait of somebody because of their accomplishments, we couldn't do it, we couldn't get it all in. And, but this was what we devised. We decided to give all these photos to Joachim, our designer, and uh, this is what he came up with. And I'm really, really happy with it. So you guys are the bookends to this incredible book. And, and I decided to end the book with uh, a call to action. Basically, this is an invitation to people who are inspired the book to, to work on the, the community and the tribal level, because that is kind of where it all came together, where we decided to, to sit across each other in a room and, and uh, work it all out. You know, Without that, we wouldn't have a movement. This is the, the, the LGBT center where I happened to take this photo quite accidentally one day. Okay.
don't feel ugly anymore. <laughs> So I, I think I chewed up your Q&A. Is there anybody with a burning desire? <laughs> yes, Mark. Uh, I just wanted to say that I, Danny, uh, when I interviewed him, like, 20 years ago, they talked about working in the store. <laughs> and one reason... You can't hear me? No. Okay. I said 20 years ago, when I interviewed Danny for... BAR or something, he was talking about doing this book. And one reason that it may not have happened until now is that he dedicated himself to, to the preserving Harvey's reputation. It's, he was at the center of the statue, the bust getting put up. He was at the center of pushing for the movie to get made. He absolutely and selflessly worked on that stuff. I'm sure if he hadn't done that for 15 years, we would have seen this book earlier, but that's what an activist does. So. We, we are gonna get really rudely kicked out by security, like v very soon, because the whole building has to close down at eight, but if anyone else, has yeah, well, well, we were going to go to 8, 7, 20 with yeah. Q&A, so, no, but then we're, what's that? 7.40, we have to be out, right? Or 10 to 8, 10 to 8, 10 to 8 people really should clear the building. Because, no, no, the reason is, and that's why we did the after party, is so that you could just simply walk across the plaza and continue the party, and I'll be happy to answer questions there. Um, and I also want to sign some books over here for the next 30 minutes. So uh, why, don't we just, why don't we just close on that note and uh, we'll, we'll, move it, we'll move it over to the green room. <laughs>